Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. Who wants a bunk bed, Bell? There's never been a better time to sign up for a yearly EPP, Extra Podcast Person Membership, to Real Ghost Stories Online. Right now, when you become a yearly EPP, you'll get one month free membership to our EPP programs. You'll also be able to claim your very own bunk bed bell. Plus, you'll be doing your part to help keep our show on the air. It's amazing. It's all amazing. We feel so much better. A show that helps thousands of people worldwide. Thanks again for uh, providing this outlet and making it so non-threatening. Feel not so alone with their haunting experiences. You guys are amazing. Um, we listen to you all the time. Become a yearly EPP now. Get a free month of our EPP membership and get your very own bunk bed bell. Hurry though, supplies are limited. If you're currently a monthly EPP, then upgrade your membership now to a yearly membership and get your bunk bed bell and a free month of EPP membership to Real Ghost Stories Online. I think it's important for people to be able to have a place where they can share their experiences and validate them because these things are real. Sign up now to be a yearly EPP at ghostpodcast.com. And thanks for your support. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That indeed it is. And on today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, a sleepover turns frightening when a little boy shows up that doesn't belong there. A listener's workplace is something so ominous It gives her panic attacks. Little boy finds terror in the night that comes in the form of voices of a couple. And what could it mean when two sisters share the same horrific nightmare? Those stories and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Hi. And how are you? I'm good. How are you? It feels like fall officially today. It's cold and and damp. And it smells like fall too. Mm -hmm. It has that, uh, that, that, that's significant specific scent <laughs> and and there is that that kind of chillness in the air that really does make it feel much more fall like than uh, than before so i guess it's here i guess summer is done yeah well that's okay i'm not cool with that because it's not quite well it is it's it, it is fall so <laughs> yeah. uh 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at real ghost stories online to share your real ghost stories with us of course you can write it on the website real ghost stories online.com or email your stories to us just go to uh your email and send it to tony t-o-n-y at real ghost stories online.com to send us your uh, your audio file of your stories so lots of ways to get them to us here at the program let's uh, go into our first letter of the day and it uh, comes into us from Carmen. Carmen says, I'd like to start off by mentioning how much you guys really carry me through my work day and long car rides. I absolutely adore the brewskis. Never a dull mo- moment. Always make me laugh. You two have come together to create a peace of mind for those of us who are looking for assurance and answers to questions that are just unexplainable. I'm tremendously grateful. Now, to begin my real ghost story, I'll start off with a few facts about myself. My name is Carmen Ann. I was raised in Detroit, Michigan. My family came from Cebu, Philippines. I've always been sensitive. Unfortunately, I have only had terrifying experiences. One vivid experience I'll never forget took place at my mother's best friend's house, who I'll refer to as an aunt. My aunt was an open sensitive who was never too shy to talk about her paranormal experiences. One day, she called my mother over to hang out while the husbands went out for a drink. While they gossiped, the children played. My aunt had two boys, two of them being twins and just infants at the time, and the other oldest, age five. My mother brought my sister, age 10, and myself, age 12. This night, we ended up staying over. My sister and I slept in the boys' room on a car bed. My mother fell asleep on the couch, and my aunt slept in the master room with the boys. In the middle of the night, I was awoken out of my sleep with this unbearable, deep, sad feeling. I could feel it in my chest. I sat up in bed and I could hear down the hall, the master room, my aunt's son talking in his sleep. 
He was known for having uncontrollable night terrors and yelling in his sleep. And I looked towards the bedroom door. The random feeling of sadness that took, that took over me was overcome by fear. I was frozen and my eyes were locked on a young boy, just the height of the doorknob, wearing a flannel shirt and overalls. I could not see his hands nor his feet. He was gray like fog. He just stared at me. I just couldn't look away from him. I was so scared. I shook my sister awake and asked her if she could see the boy too. And to this day, we can both describe what the boy looked like. She was scared and asked me to turn on the lamp next to the bed. And I scrambled to switch on the lights and he was gone. I wanted to wake my mom. So I walked slowly towards the door and out into the pitch black hallway that led to the living room where my mother slept. I could see her in the moonlight that shed through the window, but over her was a huge dark mass similar to the blob of blackness, darker than the room blocking the light from the moon. I don't know how else to describe the feeling it gave me, but something told me that if I came any closer, it would hurt her. So I went back into the room to lay next to my sister, just wishing someone would wake up. Eventually, I fell asleep for what felt like a couple of hours. The next morning, we were eating breakfast together, and my aunt had noticed I wasn't quite myself. I'm assuming I looked beat and tired and groggy. I did not hesitate to tell them what my sister and I had witnessed the night before. I left out the other part. I left out the, the part about my mother because I did not want to scare her. My aunt looked at my mother in disbelief. She told us that I can see children that run through the house. She explained that her friend, who is a medium from the Philippines, came over to visit the U.S. and she stayed in her house. While she was there, she told my aunt there were a lot of children playing throughout her home. I felt better but still had so many questions. Why did I feel so sad? Why are there so many children? Are they having trouble passing over? If so, was a dark entity over my mother keeping them there? There's an elementary school down the block from my aunt's. So I never investigated the history, but maybe that has something to do with it. Many, many years later, I'm now 26 years old. My mom and I were having a conversation on the phone about a dream she had overnight. She said there was a dark black mass over her body suffocating her. She couldn't move or breathe. When she awoke from the dream, she felt out of breath and had chest pains. Nothing was in the room that she could see, but she felt someone or something was there watching her. I told her I saw the dark mass over her when I was little. It didn't want me to go near her. It was very negative. She was shocked and we just could not explain it. The thought of something so dark following my mother and affecting her in this way for so long made me very upset. She said she has dreamed this often. We haven't talked much about it since. Thank you guys so much. This is the first time I've ever written about my paranormal experience and we'll be writing about them more to you guys. I'm becoming an EPP very soon. My sister and I shared a bunk bed growing up. Many stories to follow. Love you guys. At first, I kind of thought maybe the little guy was sad because he wasn't wasn't getting to participate. Mm -hmm. But then the way it seemed to kind of threaten the mom, I started to think maybe it really wasn't a little little kid. Yeah, unless it's just a really pissy, you know, ornery little kid mm -hmm. um, that you know likes to take vengeance on people. Sure. Which I don't know. That I guess could happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it it did seem to get a little vicious there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did did that. Uh, Sway, I mean, that, that's obviously what swayed you to make you think it might not be just... Uh, just a little kid. Yeah. Do you think there are little kids there that are mixed with some other things that are there too? Maybe so. And maybe yeah. that's an easy one for it to go to for trying to blend in or, yeah. you know, I'm going to make them think it's one of the kids and it's not. It's me. Especially if there's already kind of that preconceived thought or notion that it's already all all kids there mm -hmm. and that there there wouldn't be anything else. I agree. Um, it's uh, it's a troubling one. Thank you for uh, taking the time to share that. I'm glad we could be the outlet for you to get that, uh, that one off your chest. That's what we do here on the show. If you have a ghost story, you can share it with us and we're not going to judge it. We're not going to think you're crazy. Either will our community. Um, and uh, you can do it in any way you like. You can write it in. Sometimes that's therapeutic. So you can call it in, share it in your own words, or uh, even uh, email it, and that's another, another way of writing it, uh, and uh, and get it into us, and uh, we may share it on a future episode uh, of the program. Sometimes, you know, not even, you know, getting answers, because that's, you know, it's funny, like, what do you think? Am I going to get answers? No. We'll give you opinions, but there really are no true answers to any of this. No. It's just, you know, based on some of the stuff we've heard, you know, this kind of lines up with some other things. We'll let you know you're, you're certainly not alone in, in the experiences you have, but um, there's really no way of, of any of us definitively saying this is what it was. 
but we'll try and help connect the dots. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. If you want to uh, check out uh, some of the best stories that we've ever gotten in um, and ones you may have never even heard uh, that weren't even on the show, uh, we have our book out now, by the way. By the way. It's uh, Real Ghost Stories, Haunting Encounters Told by Real People. Uh, it's out there on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, and wherever books are sold. So we'll be sure to go ahead and check that out. Our uh, episode of the show today is brought to us by Zip Recruiter. That's a difficult thing to do uh, in uh, in today's world. Hiring people, if you're in that position, if you're in the um, uh, the the person who makes those choices, you know how difficult it can be. Uh, there's candidates out there, but finding qualified candidates for the job is is not not the easiest of things. With Zip Recruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one with one click. Then your powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job with ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate through the site within the first day. That's pretty good. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. If uh, you are in charge of this and there's an owner above you, they will thank you and love you for using this service. Uh, find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs in ZipRecruiter for absolutely free. That's right, free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. One more time. Try it for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. Let's go to our next letter. It uh, says, hi, Tony and Jenny. It's Sarah from Illinois again. I have an update on the ghost at my job and a story from a friend. To refresh your memory, I work at a conjoined grocery store and gym. My creepy coworker has been uh, has been more has seen more activity than ever and i don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that i've been talking about it a lot or what but every time i look in the back i have a mental image of a creature crouching on the ceiling where the wall and ceiling meet i also feel something behind me like practically hovering over me constantly to the point of where i'll take the long way around the gym instead of cutting through the back like usual last week i was working and a coworker was in the back of the grocery store I was in my office and the walls between us are paper thin and I heard him yell, hey. I thought nothing of it because the stock boys are always messing around and goofing off on their downtime in between carryouts. When I went to the store to clock out, he asked me why I was banging on the wall. Confused, I asked him what he was talking about and he said he was standing in the back and someone was beating on the wall and he said it sounded like I was trying to bust through. I never heard anything. The other stock boys and employees have been hearing a lot of voices coming from the vents, the bathroom doors opening and closing, and unexplained noises in the butcher room. I'm pretty sure the ghost at the store is an old manager, but whatever is at the gym feels dark. Two weeks ago, I had a panic attack in the gym. It felt like someone was sitting on my shoulders. I felt depressed. My chest felt like it was caving in, and I couldn't think clearly. There was something there, and I could see a tall, dark, slender shadow. I didn't see it with my eyes, but I saw it in my mind. I swear I'm not crazy, even though as I'm writing this, I'm questioning my own sanity. Every time I see it or feel it, I'll say a prayer of protection, and I'm not even religious. But when I do that, it seems to, black, to back off. It never seems to leave, but it will leave me alone for a day or two. I have a friend whose grandma is Native American, and she's supposed to bring some sage. So once I'm able to do that, I'll write back and give you an update. My friend's story is shorter. Her boyfriend had left a really old compass in her dorm room, and she put it on her desk and went to class. When she came back, it was gone. No way he could have taken it because he lives an hour away. Since the compass has been in her dorm, she's had so many things happen. Knocking on the door, no one's there. Footsteps running all over the place. Weird dreams, just to name a few. He took it back this past weekend, and she said all the activity stopped almost immediately. I don't know exactly how old it is, but she went and sent me a picture, and it looks extremely old. That's all for now. Hope this wasn't too long, but I just wanted to give an update on my creepy coworker. Thank you for all you do. You guys are awesome, and thank you so much for introducing us to uh, the other podcast, Hillbilly Horror Stories. It's a, a gentleman we had on the show a couple. Yeah, we talked to him, and, and he's a listener of our show. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I said he said they binge on their show one day. Have a great day, guys. Love you. 
I'm glad they were able to pinpoint that it was the compass that mm -hmm. caused everything to go haywire. Yeah. You know, since that probably was somebody's, I guess, go-to tool at one time. <laughs> And still make, might be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and still trying to figure out uh, where uh, north is. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I, I was going to ask, well, did they ever find it after it was missing? But obviously they did if he got it back. And got rid of it. I'm just wondering where it was. Where did it go? That would be my question is where did they end up finding it? You know, I would think that if I were spirit and I was attached to something and I really liked where I ended up, mm -hmm. I would hide the object I was attached to so they couldn't get rid of it and get rid of me. Where would you put it? Someplace they wouldn't look. I don't know. In the wall? Could you yeah. get? Could, could you take it into the wall, or are you? Or is the objects that you're manipulating still restricted by, you know, physicality? I don't know. Like you can float it around, but you still got to have a clear path through that maze. You know me. I'm all about getting into walls and putting them back up. So I, I would stick it in the wall. That'd probably be a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. What would you attach yourself to? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I used to collect pocket watches. I could attach myself to a pocket watch. I think I collect, I'd attach myself to an iPad or something. Then I, you're for sure not going to be I could play around games. very long because you're going to be obsolete. <laughs> I mean, I know a pocket watch is pretty obsolete, but people collect those. Nobody collects iPads. Well, you never know. It's not not <laughs> uh, far enough. Yet. There's going to be someday we're going to be really old and it's like, oh, look at dad, dad's old iPad collection. Yeah. You know, we're getting rid of that shit. <laughs> There I am trying to, to send messages and somebody, you know, threw me away. Yeah. Just be aware, kids and grandkids that are listening to the show years later. I attached myself to an iPad. Go find it. <laughs> uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Jennifer uh, writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. I'm Jennifer from EPP episode 106. Oh, that one. That Jennifer. It's kind of getting to where it's harder to remember what story was sure. on that show. I was the girl that saw the body in the basement. Oh, that person that saw the body in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> I've been meaning to write in again, but I've been busy with a new baby. I wanted to answer the questions you two had. I'm definitely very sensitive. I've had experiences with spirits all my life. It's something that runs in my family on both sides. My parents didn't experience a lot of things in this house, though. Just things being moved. All the intense stuff happened to my brother and me. I'll share some of the things that happened to him in the basement. One night, everyone was awoken by my brother's screams. I ran down to the main floor to see what was going on, and my brother was in tears, talking about a man that was in the basement smoking. I could smell the cigarette smoke coming through the open door to the basement. I remember being afraid, thinking someone had broken in the house. My father and mother emerged in the basement and said there was no one in the basement. My mom was freaked out because both my parents smelled the smoke as well. My parents do not smoke and they didn't find a cigarette nor anything to light a cigarette in the basement. Also, it was doubtful that my brother at such a young age would be smoking. Recently, I asked my brother to refresh my memory about what he saw that night. He was lying in bed trying to fall asleep. His door was open and he could see into the dark basement. He started to hear footsteps slowly coming down the stairs. He started to recognize that the footsteps sounded like boots. With very, or with every step, he could hear the spinning of the spurs. Down the stairs came a man covered with flames. He was wearing a biker jacket and pants with the boots. He walked to the landing of the stairs and turned and looked at my brother with a large, sinister grin. The man then placed a cigarette in his mouth and lit it with his finger. That was when my brother started screaming. He said the man disappeared before my parents opened the basement door. Here's another experience he had that has always stuck with me. One day my brother and I were talking in his room. I noticed the frame of his Jesus picture had a large crack. It was situated on the wall higher than my brother could reach, so I thought it was a little odd that it was broken. I asked him how he broke his picture, and he looked at me hesitantly, then stated, I didn't break it. What do you mean you didn't break it, I asked. I'm looking at it, and it's broken. He told me that at night, a man and a woman would come in his room. He said he couldn't see them, but he would talk to them. He'd say mean and scary things. A few nights before, they came and were mad about my brother's picture of Jesus. They were saying how stupid Jesus is and broke the picture frame. He also said sometimes they would slap him, and that was one of the reasons why he later started sleeping upstairs with me. 
I have many more stories to tell. I'll write in again and tell about my experiences with a spirit that dressed like the Grim Reaper, who I called the Sickle Man. Thanks, Tony and Jenny. And I think we did feature the the Sickle Man on an EPP episode. Okay, I think that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do kind of recall that. So this uh, was probably written in... January. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. I know. It sounds like they have some lovely spirits in that house that are are, <laughs> are just completely innocent and have nothing negative associated with them. No. Yeah, th these would be ones where I would certainly say pretty confidently it's probably just not the ass soul that's yeah. that's hanging out i think you got something probably a lot darker that takes different forms and is basically out or was out to freak the hell out of the kids yeah what if it's still there i don't know at that place i, I i'd be curious to ask and I'll, I'll ask the questions and then we'll get the answers in six months <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'll be like i don't remember what i asked um uh, and it's not that they're slow writing the answers in. It's just that's how long it'll take us to get to the story. Um, but uh, it'll be, uh, my question would be, uh, does the family still have the house? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, that still goes on there? And if not, do they know who's who has the house? And I'd be curious if they know them well enough just to ask. Anything weird ever happened here? Wouldn't you be afraid, though, that that would stir something up? Yeah, probably. <laughs> But it's not me asking. I'm asking other people. To do it. Oh, okay. So that makes it all right. <laughs> it makes it all okay then. It's just, you know. Okay. No. I, I, it, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, there you go. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Write it at the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Or become an EPP and get access to all of our bonus episodes. Lots of them. 160 some of those. Brand new ones every single week. Filled with our best stories that you only get there. You can get those at Ghost Podcast. Dot com ghost podcast dot com jess writes in hi my name is jess and i'd like to start off by saying that i discovered your podcast this week and i've been obsessed ever since my story has to do with a paranormal investigation that my friend and i went to a few months ago at a haunted mineral hotel in illinois called the original mineral springs hotel I knew from research that places with mineral water or something of that nature could attract more spirits and more activity due to the spirits gaining energy from the minerals, so I went in expecting something to happen, but not as much as we ended up experiencing. As soon as you walk into the hotel, you get overwhelmed with a creepy feeling of nostalgia because of how old it looks. We ended up finding out that our room that we had gotten for the investigation was in the part of the hotel that had not been renovated and was part of the old construction. That became more apparent as we got closer to the room. As soon as we walked up to the third floor, my friend and I commented that we both felt extremely dizzy and heavy when we were on that floor. Our room was pretty creepy. There were pictures of hats on the wall and hats hung up on the walls as well. This was pretty creepy because one of the most notorious ghosts of the area, the lady in white, is known to be wearing a large hat. After doing the dinner uh, briefing with the rest of the paranormal investigators, my friends and I decided to take a dip in the pool. The pool was indoors and was placed in the middle of the hotel. It was about 9 o'clock or so, and we were talking and waiting in the pool when a tall, dark-haired man wearing steampunk-esque clothes and a top hat walked from the kitchen area onto the left of the pool and went into where the Mineral Springs baths are located to the right of the pool. I was facing in his direction, and my friend was facing me, but still had a clear view of his direction. He stopped and looked at me and said, hello, and waved and continued walking. I said hi back and continued talking to my friend. I found the way he dressed super strange, but since my friend had a clear view of him, I didn't feel the need to comment on it since I assumed she had seen him as well. The way he said hello was also very strange. He said it in a way you might expect someone from the 1920s to say it, almost like a vintage dialect. After we finally got out of the pool and began our investigation, one of the places we went into was the spa room upstairs. The spa room was a large back area of the second floor that had multiple little rooms inside of it. At first, we were with a large group of about 10 other investigators, but once there didn't seem to be too much activity, everyone left. But my friend and I ended up going back in there. As soon as we went back in the spa area, something told me not to take a step further towards the smaller rooms. My friend went back there, and after five minutes of silence, she ran out saying, Something is back there. After we made it out of the room, she finally told me that she had seen a mist that began to form into a human, with arms forming first, while it was trying to reach out and grab her. 
They went to the first floor by the pool so she could calm down, and two other investigators came and talked to us. During the conversation, one of the other investigators said to me that they had been waiting by the pool because they had heard that a man in a top hat normally haunts this area. As soon as they said that, my heart stopped, and I remembered the man in the top hat had said hello to me so strangely. I also had recalled that at the time he went into the mineral bath area. The mineral baths were closed to the public. I told him what I had seen and asked my friend for verification, and she was looking in his direction as well. Much to my fright, she says, what are you talking about? I didn't see anyone. You were looking right at him, I said. She kept insisting that she saw no one walk past, let alone someone in a top hat. I said hello. Needless to say, I did not sleep that night. And many other strange things occurred throughout the night as well. We also found out after doing some research upon leaving that there's a YouTube video of another group of investigators in the spa room explaining how a white mist was forming in front of them with arms outstretched in the same spot that my friend had seen the same thing. Rumor has it that it's that very spot that she likes to appear to people. What do you think? Did we encounter the man in the top hat and the lady in white? Thank you for everything you do. I think definitely the guy in the top hat. Maybe the lady in white, yeah. but the top hat was a full-bodied apparition. So that's that's pretty cut and dry, I think. It's funny when you know you, you go with the intent of being on a ghost investigation and you're you're wanting to catch something, you're wanting to experience something, but you end up experiencing the paranormal event when you're not even technically doing the investigation. You're just it, it's the leisurely time, mm -hmm. and you don't even realize it as it happens. Right. I think that that happens very often. Yeah. I bet there's a lot of encounters with the paranormal that people are completely oblivious to that it is even is paranormal. Because mm -hmm. if you were saying staying at this hotel, we're not part of the investigation, just staying there. You're in the pool, you see the guy, oh, that's an eccentrically dressed person. Okay, <laughs> move on with your day. And especially if ghosts aren't your thing, you know, you don't aren't so inclined to look into that sort of stuff. It's just like, whatever. Mm -hmm. I imagine these things happen all the time at, at older locations and places, hotels, theaters and stuff. Mm -hmm. For folks like that, that are just, they're not going to look it up. They're not trying, they're not seeking it out. It just happens. Mm -hmm. And they're there. Yeah. I always wonder that about like shopping malls and stuff. <laughs> how, no. how many are ghosts? Well, yeah, well, well, shopping malls are still of people in that people go to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, just things like that, where there's a lot of energy going around. There's just lots of people or, or really anything where, where lots of people, uh, you know, conjugate. Uh, how many of them are, are, are living? Mm -hmm. I guess would be my question. Sounds kind of crazy, but. No, it's something to think about because yeah. obviously they feed off of different energies. You would think a place like a shopping mall would have a lot of energy for it to feed off of. I'd haunt a mall. Yeah, you would. I could see that. But the thing is, like, there's, I would, what I would do is I want to haunt one of the, like, abandoned mm -hmm. creepy ones and then freak the shit out of the people who go in there to ex urban explore it. Okay. Because that would just be awesome. <laughs> I could see you doing that. I would love to, I mean, try and find, like, some old, like, you know, mannequins or something and just kind of, like, manipulate them and move them around and mm -hmm. suddenly mannequins are chasing people out of them. Yeah. Out of the old Boston store. Yeah, you, you would totally do that. <laughs> that would be great fun. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Unfortunately, a lot of the malls that I, I used to go to, a lot of them are uh, that, that became defunct mm -hmm. are uh, are gone. They're ripping them down or, or have ripped them down. There's some that are, are getting there, like my hometown mall is kind of getting to be a ghost mall. Um, so God knows what's going to happen with that eventually. But uh, some of the other ones I was reading the other day, like the one in Sheboygan that I used to go to, defunct, mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. Lots of them, lots of them going away. Did you ever think malls would go away when we were kids? No, never. Because it was kind of a, a thing where the downtowns were gone. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no shopping downtown per se. Um, and malls are what really took it over. Mm -hmm. And that became the thing. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is just... This is kind of the new thing, I guess, but it was it was always there for us because they had come of age and we were very, very young or before we were mm -hmm. born. Um, and it was just like, wow, this, these are, if downtowns are gone, well, then malls are going to have to be it. I never in my wildest dreams thought when I was a kid that I'd be taking my kids to a, a defunct mall or a, a, a mall that I was used to be thriving mm -hmm. and it would be like what my mom did when she took me to our old downtown and we'd walk past the empty storefronts and she'd go yeah this store used to be there that store used to be there now you can do that with your own kids 
But now, where do the stores go? Now, now, what do our kids, what are they going to do? Because you can't walk, you know, past the Amazon website. And that's, that's, no, that's what they're going to do. They're going to go to the uh, the Wayback Machine website. Right. And you know what I'm talking about? No. The Wayback Machine is a website. And this has existed for quite a while. Okay. Um, and it takes images of of websites mm -hmm. and like downloads all the data and it archives it for historical purposes. Okay. So you can go back, um, you know, it works if it's a popular website better, um, but you can type in yahoo.com uh, and take a look at what Yahoo looked like on X date, however far back this thing goes. And it archives it back to about, I think this thing started around like 97 or 98. Okay. Um, and it's really kind of interesting to take a look back at what some websites looked like mm -hmm. back in the day. I'll look at my old radio station websites every now and then there I am. And it's, you know, like I, the 22 year old version of me and my bio of at 22 and <laughs> It's kind of funny, but that, that's, I don't know, maybe that's all it's going to be. It's going to be, oh, and, and kids, take a look. This is, uh, this is walmart.com. What's Walmart? You know, yeah, I know. <laughs> although I don't think that will ever die. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It's, I, 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 some of those things I think are just, there's going to be a close to it and there's, there isn't going to be a replacement, mm -hmm. which is kind of sad. 855-853-4802 uh, is our number. F writes in. Hello. My story uh, is about our uh, in-flight ghost named Sarah. On August 16th, 1987, Northwest Flight 255 at McDonald, at McDonald Douglas MD-82 crashed shortly after takeoff from the Detroit, the Detroit airport. The only survivor was a four-year-old girl. On that aircraft was a flight attendant commuting to work. The flight was full. But the crew put her in the laboratory for takeoff. And prior to 9-11, we could do that without the knowledge of management, of course. After the crash was thoroughly investigated, the airline salvaged whatever they could to use as spare parts, i.e. oven doors, handles, knobs, non-safety related parts. Such must have been part used on one of our aircraft, an MD-80. Initially, Flight attendants reported the lights coming on to bright on uh, night flights, coal bells and laboratory bells going off on their own. The pilots would repeatedly write it up in the logbook and the mechanics would find nothing wrong and sign off numerous times. Then the in-flight phone call started. The first one was after the service. Flight service manager sitting up front got a call. He picked it up saying, hello, this is Jim at door one. The female voice said, hi, this is Sarah in the back. It's cold and dark back here. Please help me. Jim promptly walks to the back of the plane where two female flight attendants were sitting. First time flying with them, so he didn't recall their names and assumed one of them was Sarah. When they informed him they didn't call, he assumed the pilots were playing with him. After calling up front, they denied it, and Jim did not believe him, but was a good sport about it. That first call opened the floodgates to many calls from Sarah. Now, the fastest way of communicating anything is not by telephone or telegraph, but teleflight attendant. How we love a good story. Now that we all became aware, the in-flight calls started coming more often. Of course, the lights, call bells, temperature were all going berserk. All that any honest-to-goodness pilot could do is just write it up as a mechanical glitch. My friend Brian decided to comfort Sarah next time she called, and sure enough, it came. Ding dong. This is Brian, door one. Hi, this is Sarah in the back. It's cold and dark back here. Help me, please. Brian, listen here, Sarah. You're dead. Stop calling. Move on. Sarah, I don't want to talk to you. End of conversation. One fl female flight attendant reported being in the aft laboratory of said aircraft on the nearly empty flight. And while fixing her makeup, the door banged loudly three times and the door shuddered. She opened the door to find no one there. The nearest passenger was seated approximately 15 rows forward. She thought maybe it was the aircraft when back in again, three loud bangs. She opened the door quickly and no one was there. Went back for waiting for the banging again. And sure enough, again, three bangs. She opened the door quickly to find no one there. She walked up to the passenger seat and wrote 15 rows forward and asked him if he saw anyone and if he heard the loud banging. He said no, and no one walked to the back at all, and he did not hear a thing. The banging was so loud that he should have heard something, which he denied. Another male flight attendant on a different flight, same aircraft, also reported the same incident with a banging, but no one near the laboratory heard a thing. They both reported that the, the, that according, the accordion-style door bent inwards with each bang. All these stories reached fever pitch, and a few flight attendants realized with a bit of investigating who Sarah was 
and she needed to cross over. While the aircraft was overnighting at home base, they brought in a Catholic priest to set Sarah free. After the priest and the group prayed for Sarah, there were no more incidents with that particular plane again. We have to look after our own, even when they're not physically with us. I changed the names of the flight attendants and the aircraft that Sarah haunted. It was not Northwest, now part of Delta, but another airline that used salvaged parts from Northwest. The airlines get funny about such publicity, so I omitted my airline's name. P.S. Please don't use my full name on the air. Thank you. I'm kind of leery now. Well, that's like the second or third aircraft story we've had about using reclaimed parts and then the plane being haunted. It's like, why Why are they doing that? Is it really saving that much money to use these reclaimed parts? Because it's they don't seem to be... I mean, I don't know what airplane parts go for. I'd... I'd imagine, you know, some of that stuff is not super expensive if it's just like a cabinet door, but maybe it is because it's for a plane yeah. and it has to have so many, you know, fireproof, this proof, that proof and certain weights and, and all, you know, there's, yeah. I could imagine some, some simple things that we don't really think of normally probably are not, it's not necessarily just as cheap as normal. Yeah. That's my guess. I, I can say at least when it comes to flooring that's the way it is but obviously you're not going to reuse flooring from a crashed plane and another sure. plane yeah. but i know that there's a lot of um things that that go into what they can and can't put on there mm -hmm. and, and fire ratings and all that kind of stuff sure but it just that's something i really hadn't thought of before doing the show is that somebody reuses any salvageable parts I, I wonder if that's still something that's done, though. I mean, now you know, nowadays, when there's an airplane crash, mm -hmm. well, even back then, this is what I'm kind of weirded up by, is you, you you have the investigation, the plane gets, you know, re-pieced together as best as possible mm -hmm. for the investigation. Those parts, after the investigation, is that when they get salvaged back? Or... Or are we talking about a time and place where the investigations didn't get that detailed? I don't know. Because I remember like TWA Flight 800, they pretty much rebuilt it mm -hmm. the best they could mm -hmm. in a hangar um, with the parts that, that they found. Um, and if you've seen pictures of it, it's pretty stunning. Like, oh, holy shit, there's the plane again. Um, you know, kind of almost hodgepodge together. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, other other crashes and things of that nature that are pretty bad i mean i don't know where did they i mean i don't want to sound morbid here but it's like what you find the door in the field and it was in good condition and it's like okay let's uh, let's pull that one back up or maybe is it just because this sounds like a pretty nasty flight that it was everyone died on it was it doesn't sound like oh we skidded and off through off the runway and you know a couple people got injured no but the plane you know most of the plane you know was intact Something like that, you know, where it's just like, it's not a usable plane anymore, but it wasn't horrific fireball. No, this one was pretty much fireball. Like, I was surprised that they had any How do you get parts part? left. Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I don't know. God, that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's still done or not. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Marlena writes, and hello, guys. I've written to you before about my sister, my mother, sisters, and I being hexed. So I just wanted to tell you about a couple of smaller things that have happened to us. When I was younger, maybe about 12 years old, I had a really bad nightmare. At the time, I didn't think much of it. But let me tell you some, uh, somewhat of how it went because it'll uh, make more sense later in the story. My dream consisted of me standing at the top of a big dark staircase that encircled the front entrance of this really dark house. As I stand there, I notice that the house is really dark with wooden dark walls and heavy velvet curtains over the windows, and it's just really dark. So I'm standing at the top of the staircase, looking down, and I can see the front door, and it's still dark. The rooms are behind me, and I feel like there's something in one of the rooms waiting to jump out and get me. So, in my dream, I feel this sense of dread and the feeling like this thing is coming and it's fast and it's going to get me. I start running down the stairs, which seems to become longer as I run down them, and I can feel my heart beating really fast in my chest, and I feel really cold. As soon as I reach the door, I go to open it, and it doesn't open. And it's at that moment that without looking back at the stairs, I know this thing is out of the room and coming for me, but I wake up. 
Now, this certain dream I've dreamt over and over all my life, and I never really thought much of it other than it's a scary dream I have. But in the most recent dreams, I see what's coming to get me, and it almost looks like your typical scary movie character, like a mix between The Exorcist and The Girl from the Ring. It's just weird and creepy. Again, I've never thought of this as anything abnormal until about maybe five years ago. My eldest sister, Jen, was going through a really tough time in her life, and a lot of things were happening to her some of which I've written to you about. Well, my boyfriend and I were living with her at the time, and she woke up one morning and told me she had a really bad dream. I sat down with her to listen to her and tell me and to have her tell me her dream. It wasn't until this point in my life that I knew there was something more than us and just irregular things occurring to us throughout our lives. When we began telling, when she began telling me her dream, she began telling me about a really dark house that she was in. She said that in her dream, She'd wake up standing at the top of the stairs that encircled the entrance to the front door. The walls were really dark, dark wood, dark and heavy velvet curtains that covered the windows. Unlike my dream, in her dream, she's standing there and looks back to one of the rooms, and the same girl is standing at the end of the hall staring at her. At first, she doesn't speak and only chases her down the stairs to the front door. She says that once she reaches the front door, the girl grabs her, and as soon as she does, all of a sudden, it's like she awakens but she's back at the top of the stairs. She keeps doing this throughout her dream, just running downstairs and getting to the door just to be caught by this girl. As this happens, each time the girl catches her, she gets faster and faster at catching her and later even speaks and tells her, I've got you. But my sister told me the story. I had the chills. I had the worst feeling. And I told her about my dreams. I'd have just like hers, but mine were more sporadic. I don't know how to explain this. How could we have such a similar dream without ever knowing that either of us had had this dream before she told me about these nightmares she was having for weeks? Our dreams were so similar with us finally waking up at 3.30 a.m. after every dream, but hers lasted for weeks, maybe about six weeks, where she keeps having this reoccurring nightmare. As for me, I had my first dream when I was very young and sporadically here and there. I'm still having this dream. It really just takes me back and makes me think that we're truly hexed. There's just so much negativity towards us and around us. That's just a story I thought you guys would enjoy and possibly give some insight or your thought on. I appreciate you listening to me. I love the show, and I'm so happy that my coworker mentioned it. I'll send more in later. You know, I think if you just think it's happening to you and it's a dream, a lot of times you don't share, you know? Like, I... I have crazy dreams, like just, and I know that they're just batshit crazy mm -hmm. and I don't really share them, but you know, if you have a nightmare, unless, you know, somebody really wants to know and says, Hey, what, you know, what was your nightmare about? Most people, you just kind of keep it to yourself. So I could see how they would have the same dream and not know it. Mm -hmm. But I think if they're having the same dream, it's not really a dream. Well, I mean, it's a dream, I think, but what is the, why are they both having it? What is the purpose of it? I, I mean, think it's more than just the, the mind conjuring. Yes, I agree. Okay. I agree. I mean, I mean, it's occurring in a dream state. Yes. It's just what, why? Why mm -hmm. is this happening? What is the meaning of it? I wonder how often more than one person is dreaming the same thing in close proximity to each other, but they never share it because A, they're afraid to, or B, they just don't remember it. That could be. You know, I, I have dreams all the time, and I, I'll wake up at three in the morning and go, oh, it's a good one. I'm going to talk about that on the show or something. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what the hell it was by the time I get up in the morning, <laughs> other than I had the moment of going, that's a good one. I should talk about that on the show. Sure. And nothing. I, I mean, I, I couldn't even, like, pull the, the slightest tidbit from it to, to even try and trigger something back. Um, but it makes me, makes me wonder mm -hmm. about that. By the way, I have another show uh, that uh, take your calls, your dream stories, just like this show, where you write them in or you can call in your dreams. They don't even have to be paranormal. They can just be about anything. They can be they can be batshit crazy if you yeah. like. Um, and uh, and we, we listen to them and uh, then uh, kind of decipher them and uh, give you some feedback on uh, what uh, what the meanings may be, some uh, some insight. Uh, like I said, it doesn't have to be paranormal. In fact, most of the dreams on that show are not. Um, Dream Meanings is the name of that program. comes out once a week. You can subscribe to it on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, everything. Uh, Dream Meanings, and the website is dreamingradio.com if you want to submit 
a dream story to that show. Go to dreamingradio.com, phone number and website, uh, or phone number and submission form are all on that website. Maggie writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. I've been listening to your podcast for about a week now, and I absolutely love it. Anyways, let's get to it. Both of my parents grew up in Maine, so that is where almost all my relatives were, including my grandparents on my father's side. A few years ago, my grandpa passed away. Then two years later, my grandma followed. It was very hard on my dad, as you can imagine, and he was very close to both. He eventually moved back to his childhood home where they both had lived with his wife and my sister. And we were living there until they found jobs in Maine. A couple of months after my grandma's passing, my stepmom and sister, who were about four at the time, were in the guest bedroom playing on the bed. My stepmom had her back to the door and my sister was facing it. As they were playing, my sister looked behind my stepmom in the door and said in a playful voice, Hey, that lady snuck up on us. Now, this wasn't an, an unusual phrase for her, as it was what she would say anytime something would surprise her. My stepmom was curious, though, since she knew they were the only ones in the house. She asked my sister who snuck up on them, and they, she answered, That lady. My stepmom turned to look at the doorway and didn't see anything. She then asked my sister where the lady went, and my sister got up and went out of the room and turned left down the hall and into the other bedroom where my dad slept as a child. When they reached the bedroom, my sister looked around quizzically because there was no one in there. Being a four-year-old and not knowing anything about spirits, she shrugged it off and went back to the guest room as if nothing had happened. My stepmom, however, was understandably shaken. After discussing this with my dad, what we think happened was my grandma had just wanted to visit with her granddaughter and that was the only way she could. Since my sister had known her in life, we also think that my grandma didn't appear to her as an old woman, but as she would have looked to her in her prime, and that is why she wasn't recognized. It was an altogether heartwarming experience, and there were no more after that. I think that this was the last act on this plane, and that she joined my grandpa soon after. I have many more stories to tell, but I'll stop here for now. Thank you for providing such an awesome outlet for people to tell their stories. I think that's a good a good thought that it was the grandmother, but she came back in a way to where it wouldn't scare the child. Mm -hmm. To where the child wouldn't know that it was the grandmother. There's some thinking going on there. That is, that's a good thought. To but, not, uh, oh, I know you're dead. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? Right. Yeah. Because even though it's grandma, you might freak out because you know grandma's dead. Yeah. But this could just be some lady. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing that experience with us. Do greatly appreciate that. And that's going to wrap up our program for today. If you like the show, become an EPP, please. Uh, do that at ghostpodcast.com. Sign up, support our show. It's only five bucks a month. Get access to the bonus episodes every single week. Uh, you can sign up uh, for a full year if you want as well. Get uh, one of those months free. And uh, you can choose either a bunk bed bell or a bonus option of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, call with us where we'll talk about your ghost story hear it and go back and forth and ask all sorts of uh, interesting questions or crazy questions sometimes uh i'm usually the ones dishing out crazy questions but uh, they're not crazy they're just different ways to think about things that's a good way of describing my thinking mm -hmm. yes so anyway <laughs> ghostpodcast.com for all that uh, to help us uh, stay on the air. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.